Okay, so just to let everybody know, we are recording this session because it will be posted on the ASC's YouTube channel. And I will introduce our panelists and I cannot thank them enough uh, for participating in this wonderful panel. So welcome everybody. We are now doing our third webinar session for this ASC webinar series titled Beyond Dualism, Where To Now? We have with us two distinguished speakers. We have Barbara Hopkins, who is a professor of economics at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. She is a radical institutional feminist economist focusing on the interplay between gender and economic systems. She's a member of the Feminist Radical Political Economy Collective. She teaches courses in comparative capitalism, problems of economic development, comparative systems of the global South, political economy and gender and public policy at Wright Univer State University. She has published in Feminist Economics, Journal of Economic Issues, Feminist Studies, Review of Political Economy, Review of Radical Political Economics, and in several edited volumes, including Varieties of Alternative Economic Systems, Practical Utopia, Utopias for an Age of Global Crisis and Austerity. So welcome, Barbara. We also have with us Sharu, who is a professor in the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences at the University of Washington Bothell. She works on questions of economic subjectivity, gender, development, identity, and post-colonarity slash globalization. She has served as the editor of Rethinking Marxism, completed two terms as an elected member of the governing board of the Cultural Studies Association, and twice served as an elected board member for the International Association for Feminist Economics. I'm very excited to get started with this session. As a reminder, we will have our panelists presenting followed with a Q&A session. Personally, if I'm not able to be here to field the questions, my co-host Jacob Jennings will do so on my behalf. So thank you so much to our panelists and let's get started. Well, uh... Let me start us off. Uh, welcome everyone. Barb and I have decided that uh, if we wish to make a case for going beyond dualism, uh, we are also going to decide, and you're going to see why, that genre and content are related. So the genre we're going to use is not the classic one of person A followed by person B, but we have a structured dialogic process. So it's better to think of this panel or plenary as Barbara Hopkins in conversation with S. Charushila. Uh, before we start, I'd like to uh, first say welcome to friends. Oh my God, it's wonderful to see so many friends here. Uh, it's just great. I've been missing you guys post COVID. I haven't been able to go to the conferences, see your faces except online. Uh, and that's actually part of one of the points we're going to make uh, about the role of dialogue, hearing, presence and collaboration as part of how you break some of these structures. Uh, so, uh, the way it's going to proceed is I'm going to speak for about 10 minutes. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Barb. Barb is going to then uh, give a presentation of about 30, 45 minutes. And then I'm going to take back over and conclude for about another 15 minutes. And then we have Q&A. Uh, not right now, but when we come to my section, I will also be, and you'll see why it's then, I will also be naming uh, some deaths. Uh, so I want to just open with the concept of genealogy. Most people think that genealogy is about pasts, uh, or when you do references, they think it's about who have the idea first. The other thing is that my students think that it means you're not stealing ideas and you're not plagiarizing. So many of the ways we think about knowledge production have to do with private property ideas. Who got it first? Who owned the idea? Are you lying? Are you stealing, right? Genealogy says, where did the idea come from historically and socially? And what did I do with it? 
uh, that is the genealogy of knowledge going back to Foucault, as opposed to a history of knowledge or, you know, was this idea that what you're naming is debt, D-E-B-T, debt, an economic concept we understand. And part of what we're doing is we're trying to acknowledge our debt to those who came before, but we're also trying to note this is not the third world debt. This is not the permanent requirement that just because you got an idea or you owe something to people who came before you, you owe loyalty and fealty to the point where you are not allowed to critique, change, shift, and so on. And to me, I like the idea of genealogy because it's a way to acknowledge, whereas otherwise the idea of critique is a simple idea of they were wrong, I am right, I hate them, I don't write, hate them. Right. And so that's kind of how we're structuring this talk. And so I'm going to start with a genealogy. I want to open by acknowledging that the question of dualism is one that very many pioneers in economics, dissident pioneers, have raised going back at least 30, 40 years, if not longer. We're going to name a few for whom we owe debts of our own. Uh, dualism in economics emerged as a way to name difference. So there are multiple ways to think of difference. Early dualism came as a way to name differences that encoded identity. So feminist economists, uh, I would like to name people who are not often uh, given references these days anymore. It's almost like you can't reference someone uh, just because, you know, you critique them or because uh, you built on their ideas. I'd like to name Jane Rossetti as an early pioneer uh, who worked on the issue of dualism around gender. Feminist economics was one of the early, not the only, but one of the early pioneers in the concept of dualism. It makes sense because the male-female dualism became encoded in so many ways uh, that we needed to do a lot of work. And I'm going to use the post-colonial concept of critique of coloniality, which I'm going to come to, which Satya Mohanty called a space clearing gesture, that the critique was a gesture to clear the space for a new set of ideas to emerge, that you have to do something uh, to open up a space for a new way to do things. Uh, and feminist critics of dualism did not imagine that the critique alone was sufficient to itself. They saw it as a space clearing gesture, but they also saw the dualism as productive, as creating the world we live in in a certain way. So Jane Rossetti's work, especially on male-female dualisms around rationality and care, reason, emotion was very important. Uh, Anne Jennings, a real pioneer for institutionalists, did a tremendous amount of work on how these gender dualisms played out in the public-private distinctions that still actually uh, uh, shape many of the ways we talk about things in economics. Uh, Willa Grappard, who did a lot of early work on thinking about where dualisms reside. So in terms of the relationship to institutionalism, ASE, and the broader concept of dualism, I'd also like to note that these early pioneers did not just talk about dualism as there is a dualism it's cultural. They spent a lot of time thinking about the locations of this dualism. What is the role of discourse? What is the role of practice? What is the role of identity? What is the role of meaning? What is the role of institutions? And these were times of ferment. And as Barb is going to point out, these were not places where that ferment always resulted in happy resolutions. And we have something to learn from where those resolutions failed because there was a lot of anxiety about what came to be called the discursive turn or the identity turn 
or the standpoint theory turn. And there was a deep anxiety about what these meant. Uh, and in fact, many of these early pioneers faced a lot of hostility and a lot of res resistance because they were arguing that culture, which is a term that the institutionalists and Association for Social and Economics are very familiar with, might reside in places you don't expect and in ways you don't expect, in language, in practice, in institutions, in habitus, and that you might need a very different way to think about it. So in addition to gender dualism, there was some efforts to raise race. Race was a more complicated and complex term, uh, partly because there was already a well-established and very important set of traditions around race and racism that really anchored in the materiality of race in terms of wage distinctions, in terms of hierarchies of labor markets, in terms of discrimination. And it often felt that the culturalizing of race might diminish the role of economy and power in race. So it was a bit more fraught, uh, but there was an effort and, you know, uh, I was part of this uh, with yes. Iman, with a whole bunch of other colleagues to raise questions of race, raciality, race as a form of institutional performance, questions of passing, questions of modernity. Suzanne was part of this. Race then also got extended to the dualism of development, developed underdeveloped. So there was a lot of early work on racial dualism, on colonial and anti-colonial dualism, and it was a constructive discourse. It wasn't suggesting it was a, the truth, but it was suggesting that these ways of thinking about the world constructed the world. Uh, backward, forward, agrarian, industrial, modern, uh, non-modern, male, female, uh, you know, uh, uh, minority white. Uh, and part of this experience of having gone through that early phase for both Barbara and me is shaping our talk. Our particular concern is what were we doing in those times? And what did we fail to do in those times? Not because we were wrong, but because, you know, when you start something, knowledge does not emerge like Athena from Zeus's head fully formed. You got an insight, you got it all fixed, but that it's an iterative practice and that you work out what it means. And there are some things that we figured we did wrong, which we hope that our current practices can help us address and carry forward as a new way to think about how to go beyond dualisms. Our particular concern has been the way in which each of these dualisms in isolation made sense. But when you focus too much on the single dualism, male, female, for example, it erased other things. It also collapsed into a monism. It just collapsed into an A, not A. Male, so female often became not male. This is the Simone de Beauvoir point, right? Uh, uh, race just became white, not white. Development became developed, not developed. And that dualism, when it was developed in that binary fashion, collapsed into a monism. And the questions we want to ask are, what led to that? How do we avoid that? And in terms of how do we avoid that, how do we bring to bear our own institutional knowledge about how material economic cultural practices work, which is can we turn the gaze of our knowledge onto our own efforts to produce knowledge because we are also in some sense workers in an economy who are engaged in knowledge production. And so if anybody should be able to have an insight into this. It should be the people who work on workers. Uh, so that is the background of how we both want to acknowledge the debt, think about the constructive nature of dualisms, but also think about some of the limits we hit in the late 80s, early 90s.
and mid 90s, which uh, actually led to infighting, led to exclusions, led to difficult practices, uh, which were sometimes productive, but sometimes uh, hostile. And how do we go beyond dualisms to address those? So now I'm going to turn it over to Barbara. Thank you. Barbie is still muted. He's still muted. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Forgot the my proper Zoom etiquette. Anyway, um, so when Iris first approached me to do this, um, you know, I I had understood this series webinar series as being largely about inclusion, about you know, recognizing. Um, those who've been excluded. But rather than provide more evidence of exclusion and its consequences, I wanted to argue that the problem is really more fundamental and that it exists at the core of how we as economists approach our subject and the tendency toward dualism. And so that's what started these conversations between Charu and I about dual. Well, it didn't really start the conversations because Charu and I have really been talking about this for years, but it prompted the recent manifestation of these conversations. I want to argue that the field of economics does not do difference well, and that that's part of the problem. It has trouble theorizing the different experiences of individuals or accepting theories of difference by those who are, quote, different. And by different, I mean those people who are not part of the invisible center. And the invisible center is those whose experiences are constructed as the norm from which deviation defines difference. And so that's what frames all these dualisms that Charu was talking about. And an example of that is I had a friend in graduate school who was told that she could not do brown on brown research reinforcing this sort of double standard. I remember thinking at the time, oh, think of the job opportunities that will be available for us if we don't allow white on white research. Um, uh, but this idea that prevents this sort of object, the idea of objectivity among subordinated persons from researching subjects relevant to subordinated peoples. Um, but it doesn't say the same thing about dominant groups. And then a couple within the last week or two, I was listening to on the media and they had a whole story about that experience for journalists where journalists of color were not allowed to do research on topics like, so that the, there was a notion that black journalists could not be objective about Black Lives Matter protests and similar kinds of things. So this, this is pervasive, not just within economics, this, this, these kinds of problems with dualisms. Now, I want to emphasize, I'm not saying here that there are no economists doing good theory on difference. What I'm saying is that those individuals tend to be marginalized within the profession because the field of economics is uncomfortable with difference. I'm arguing that this problem with difference is a feature, not a bug. That this is actually this problem within the field of economics that the problem that it has with others is not merely, merely a reflection of a racist, sexist, homophobic, et cetera, society onto which economics um, uh, is, is built from, but it's actually a predictable consequence of the structure of economics, a structure that's designed to obfuscate difference, not just difference among practitioners or economic agents, but differences in economic structures and difference, uh, differences of thought. So part of what Charu and I are also talking about here is the way in which heterodoxy in economics is constructed as another dualism and how that can be problematic. And we get to sort of the end point, end that we're trying to go to, that's where it ends up. But I plan to use examples about economic systems as metaphors for difference more broadly conceived to argue that the problem exists at a fundamental level, the level of our ontology of difference. 
comparative economic systems is, or perhaps was, a field within mainstream economics that, like heterodox schools of thought, has been marginalized because of the failure to accept difference. In this case, differences among economies. The way in which differences of economic systems have framed, been framed within the mainstream illustrate this fundamental problem with difference. And so the, the solution of this is a pluralist and collectivist methodology for knowledge creation based on an intersexual framing of economic theory that Charu is gonna expand on at the end. I also wanna say that this project is not objective in the traditional sense. It's really a reaction to the frustration and anger at the many ways in which the anti-difference ontology of economics has excluded the human experience of myself and others and many of you, probably all of you who decided to come to this talk, um, and negates economic knowledge that has made significant progress um, theorizing difference. So let's start with this whole sort of idea about universalism. The mainstream universe or the universalism within the mainstream is really the belief that the purpose of economics is to deliver universal truths about economies and economic agents using physics as the model for real science. This manifests in economics in its simplistic modeling of human nature, the basic idea of markets as universal and the tendency to reject discrimination as a social problem in need of remedy. It's the foundation for the rejection of culture as relevant to the behavior or preferences of economic agents. And this also seems to involve a one-dimensional approach to individual decision-making, such as the trade-off between leisure and money that forms the basis of labor supply models and is so troubling to feminist economics. This also leads to some of the standard value judgments made in the dominant strain of economics. Markets pay people their marginal product, uh, discrimination, class power, et cetera, don't matter there. And the allocation of resources that comes from free markets is somehow best or natural. And that's what I wanna emphasize because I'm talking mostly about economic systems here, but this idea that markets are the natural order and every other institution is a deviation from that natural order. And the idea that wages assigned by the free market are somehow an accurate reflection of a person's worth are part of the problem. Now, as a radical institutionalist, I believe that markets are not the natural order, but are in fact socially constructed institutions that come in different forms. And there's no such thing as a free market. And I believe that power differentials play a part in the processes for valuing, valuing work time and everything else. Um, as Michael Bernstein points out in a chapter entitled Shaping an Authoritarian Community, by the way, in terms of our the debts that we pay, I get this. I got this site from Deb Feigart, who is in our audience here. Um, in his history of the AEA, uh, about the direction the organization took in the 20th century, that to quote him, that that it was aimed at moving towards a value-free social science that would place in the hands of experts the means with which to secure the common good a common good about which all reasonable and educated men and women could agree. So part of what I, part of what we're trying to say here is that this idea of universalizing and of limiting things down to two oppositional ideas um, is really part, something that happened at, in order to try and gain power for econ economics as a profession. If we could be, you know, this is the one obvious thing to do and our expertise tells you that we need to do that. And that's what creates the development of the idea of policymaker as audience for the knowledge creation that we have. Now, this idea that an objective value-free science can lead to expertise that can provide universal policy advice leading to the good society has led to new institutionalist evolutionary theories that predict a natural movement to the one true path. 
This manifests in development economics is the idea of a single path in industrialization. And this, this again goes back to the, my history with Charo from the first times I've been meeting her. She has frequently used this sentence, India's present is not England's past. And I wonder, as I reflect on this, how many people actually understood what she was saying because they're so embedded in some of these ideas that they just have trouble understanding her point that, look, India is different. And yet, why is it not intuitive to consider that the development path of a colonized country would be different than the development path of the colonizer whose economic development itself has depended on its status as colonizer? Um, in comparative economic systems, this same idea of a single endpoint in systemic evolution was reflected in the debate on convergence that happened in the 70s and 80s. Market socialist reforms in Hungary and the expansion of the welfare state in Western Europe led some CES scholars to ask if we were experiencing a process of convergence to a single mixed economy. By and large, CES scholars concluded that differences are, actually, are persistent, that convergence is not happening. But there's still an appeal of the idea of a common good. More recent work on institutional evolution by neoclassical institutionalists has tended to follow Douglas North's view that the changes in the institutions will be complementary with prior changes in the sense that they will improve the efficiency of existing institutions. But political scientists disagree with this idea of complementarity, pointing out that often institutions push in different directions because they are distributive. And the political compromise involves some institutions that distribute in one direction and others that distribute in another, or one part creates disincentives to work and another creates an incentive to work because they're coming to distributional compromise. What the political scientists are pointing out is that good is not common. People have different interests that imply different economic policies. I don't wanna overstate this. There's a concept of the common good that says different distributive interests need to be balanced. But what I wanna emphasize is that what is balanced, after all, Fox News, is considers itself fair and balanced. And I just saw in my email this morning, uh, another example of a dualism where it says Fox News can't tell the difference between Hitler and, and Marx. Anyway, um, I wanna emphasize that this balance is, 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 is just all obviously gonna be more contested. Now, as an example of this, again, back from comparative economic systems, there was a really good, well, and uh, there was an interesting book on uh, the Swedish social democratic welfare state. This is published, I think, in the 1990s that argued that Swedes work fewer hours than Americans do. Thus, the welfare state creates a disincentive to work that is bad. And so Sweden needs to modify its incentives so that people work more. Now, the idea that a nation of people that on average has different preferences for work-life balance as an explanation for this was not even considered. And I think it's ironic that a discipline that puts so much emphasis on individuality has so little respect for different preferences. So how prevalent is universalism in economics? In other words, it, a lot of my examples here are old. Am I just creating a straw man here? Or is, has, has, how much has economics moved away from that? Well, one of the things is that there's no real debate over universalism. There's been a lot of criticism by the, of the mainstream by heterodox economists, but I'm unaware of any mainstream economists defending universalism. While there are mainstream economists looking for more complex ways to understand the world, I still think that the attitude that universalism can be taken for granted seems common as well. It's important to note here that universalism rejects testimony to the contrary. This, is, this goes back to this idea that this is not a debate. This is not a view that I hold and then somebody else disagrees with me. This is a view that refuses to consider that other views exist or are legitimate. One example of this from graduate school, and again, I've got some old examples here, is a paper in the labor economics seminar attempting to explain mommy tracking. And mommy tracking was this idea 
that women are concentrated in dead end jobs and not provided with training because well and then the explanations why is why are women pushed into those jobs and this paper analyzed this and pointed out that you know companies don't want to invest in training for women because they think they're going to drop out of the labor market and have children and since they have and this is a key part of her analysis since they have to pay the women the same amount then they you know and they're not getting the same payoff in terms of the training they put into it they're not going to do it so i said well this doesn't seem to be consistent with experience because what that explanation implies is that if you go back in time to a period in which you could pay women less for the same job, you would expect more women to be in those jobs. But that didn't happen that way. And what I was told was that there's that no such time existed and that you could never pay women less for the same work, that markets would not have allowed it. So I went home and I called my mother and I said, by the way, your experience is impossible. Economic theory has decided that it couldn't have happened. <laughs> um, another example that's more recent is about schools of thought. I, I have a friend in, in here in Dayton who ran into an economist from the University of Dayton in a bar and you know got to talking with him and said, well, I have a friend who's a feminist economist. And this guy said, there's no such thing. In both of these cases, economists faced with stories that conflict with what one already knows to be true is just rejected out of hand. Now, if economists could handle difference, they would know that they don't know everything and might react with, well, that's interesting. I'm unfamiliar with that circumstance. Tell me more. But that dismissiveness, that refusal to consider legitimate that conflicts with my ideas, um, there's actually, uh, there was a piece that my advisor had shared with me that was an article that was written against the work that he did that basically wrote this up and said, you know, this is all very interesting, but it's not neoclassical economics. And that was their main argument. And this is the argument that has been used against feminist economists and others. It's like, well, that's all fine, but it's not economics. That's sociology or something. So that then leads to this point that Charu made about the way in which the hierarchical dualisms flip into, get collapse into monism and universalism. A comment that I heard as a new PhD on the job market in 1994 with a specialization in comparative economic systems. I was at the ASSA and I just overheard somebody saying this in a, in a separate conversation, but they said, well, now that communism has collapsed, we're all the same and there's nothing to compare. With the collapse of one side of the dualism, economics reverts into monism and now we have universalism in terms of economic systems. So the idea of Cartesian dualisms, Cartesian dualisms is a philosophical tool for ignores, organizing things into two different sets that are mutually excuse, exclusive yet together fully encompassing. Hierarchical dualism emphasizes that one of those sets is superior to the other. And that's, uh, again, this uh, point that Charu made uh, that Simone de Beauvoir in her analysis highlights that, you know, that dualism between masculine and feminism is really masculine and not masculine. And this also plays out, I had a, I was trying to get my students to write a paper uh, and one of the rules was you can't use dualisms. And um, I, we were talking about what people's ideas about the paper were. And one student said, well, I'm going, I wanna do my paper on leisure. And I said, okay, what, how are you defining leisure? And they said, well, not work. And I said, aside from the fact that work itself is, pro I mean, from a feminist economist perspective, right, work itself is a contested concept. But that idea, of not, again, you, you, labor leisure is another one of those dualisms that people slip into. And I also want to use another example here. Nelson has done extensive research. Uh, Julie Nelson has done this uh, book on gender and risk taking in which she has exposed uh, 
the way in which this uh, desire to map masculine feminine to risk taking or not risk taking um, ha and and she's she's found that there's a bunch of emp empirically questionable uh, techniques used there that create a reveneration of those dualistic categories, dualistic categories that ultimately obfuscate the other by ignoring the variation within groups and the similarity between groups. So clearly CES is often framed in introductory textbooks as exploring that plan market dualism. For CES scholars that have not evolved into the development economists working on the transition from socialism, the end of the Cold War has disrupted that dualistic thinking, forcing a rethinking of, of taxonomies. I described this elsewhere, but the most recent textbooks include three kinds of mixed economies, market-centered, state-centered, and community-centered. Because there's a there's a realization that just the two categories are not working and it's not a we're not able to really explain what we need with that. But in economics more generally, this idea of breaking things up into two categories and arguing for the superiority of one or the other continues to drive reductionist thinking. When we teach that to introductory economics students, we set a stage for a public discourse that limits our public policy options to free market capitalism or totalitarian state control. And by the way, if you pay, if you paid attention to what Republicans are saying about for the most recent election, and you'll see it at every election into the future, they're really doing a double down on this free market capitalism versus the totalitarian state thing. Um, I saw a clip of an interview with uh, one of the Trumps, one of the Trump politicians who's a member of Congress, uh, saying essentially arguing that if we adopt universal health care in the form of a Medicare for all policy, then Taylor Swift will no longer be able to say whatever she wants um, in her songs because you get this free market capitalism or totalitarian state control. One alternative to Cartesian dualisms is the dualism of Taoist philosophy as illustrated by the yin yang symbol in which each side of the, each side of the dualism also encompasses its opposite. Once had a visiting Chinese management professor who presented a lecture in my course and he, he presented the following parable. Confucian master brought his students to a valley in which there's only one tree. It was a small scraggly looking tree. And he asked them, is this the best tree in the valley or the worst tree in the valley? So one student said that this is the best tree in the valley because it's the only tree in the valley. And then another student said, this is the worst tree in the valley because it has the only one, because it's the only one that hasn't been cut down for lumber. So both of these are correct in their own way. And it's a useful story to illustrate that understanding the true meaning of things and people is complex. But this alternative view of dualism also has not prevented the Chinese from engaging in oppression based on ethnicity. Under Mao, ethnic differences were rep repressed by claiming by, with a narrative that we're all the same. Once China opened up, ethnic differences were celebrated, but largely used for commercial gain through the tourism industry. And then today we see uh, ethnic differences being used as the source of political repression in Xinjiang. So I don't want to oversimplify the, the, the idea that just by getting, just by changing the dualisms up a little bit, we can eliminate uh, exploitation and, and exclusion. But I do want to say that coping with difference, not just understanding it, but living with it requires a rejection of dualism and, and these transformations. One example of this, again, is this idea of heterodoxy. There's no heterodox sociology or political science or anthropology. They're just different schools of thought and ideas. But in economics, we set up dualisms such as structure versus agency, which is you know, the way Marxists think versus the way uh, the descendants of Adam Smith think um, for those people who think that structure matters versus those people who think agency matters. 
Um, and heterodoxy is sort of born from this kind of exclusion that I've talked about earlier, the formation of boundaries for economics that exclude Marxist institutionalist feminists, et cetera. But mainstream heterodox economics creates another dualism that does not really capture the nature of diversity of thought. Now, Fred Lee has argued that heterodox economics or rather heterodox schools of thought, not counting the Austrians, and that, that whole, that, that requirement that we exclude the Austrians somehow highlights some of the problems with the idea of heterodoxy. But if you exclude the Austrians, then we have a lot in common. The heterodox, these different strains of thought share certain values and concepts. And similarly, Jeff Schneider has been working on a project to define heterodox principles of economics, uh, a set of propositions that we as heterodox minus the Austrians can all agree on. As a political strategy, and I, I want to emphasize Jeff, especially as the leader of ICAPE, has, this is a, a, largely a political strategy. The idea of all the minorities getting together to struggle against our oppressors still makes sense. But the dualism itself is still product, problematic. The idea that we heterodox economists can simply replace bad neoclassical theory with good heterodox theory ignores the complexity of the various heterodox positions. First, it confuses the neoclassicals and some heterodox economists. While Fred and Jeff have been trying to frame heterodoxy in positive terms, that's, that's part of that project they were doing. Well, and the separately, there are separate projects there, um, rather than defining it as not or anti-neoclassical, the heterodox neoclassical distinction in a world where neoclassical economics still dominates leads to a framing of heterodoxy as not neoclassical that is difficult to over overcome. Some years ago, a colleague who does not understand heterodox economists, economics complained that students do not understand what heterodox economics is and thus proposed a debate. Resolve, neoclassical economics is useless. Now, by the way, um, actually it wasn't that. It's like neoclassical economics is all wrong, I think is, is what it was. But, um, but the whole concept of a debate, by the way, already is a dualism because you only allow two positions, uh, two opposing positions in it. So you've already set up your dualistic thinking. But it's more or less impossible then in my department to talk about economic theory because my neoclassical colleagues insist on framing the discussion around a dualism that leaves little space for me to define what my position actually is. When I point out that this is a misinterpretation of the essence of Marxist economics, for example, that neoclassical ec economists frame this, that the neoclassical economists in my department frame that as a reasonable difference of opinion uh, about what Marx said or thought. And in fact, what I'm saying is, no, your position on what Marx said is completely framed in something that has nothing to do with Marx. And so it's inherently wrong. Um, and I think this is also a reflection, this view that um, my, whatever, whatever problem I have with the way my colleagues are talking about Marx, that this is just a difference of opinion. That view is really a reflection of this idea that there are two different sides to each argument, one heterodox and one neoclassical. And so my criticism of his view of Marx is, can be just dismissed as biased because I'm a heterodox economist. Now, second, with the dualism uh, while the dualism may appear to unite the oppressed, as I said, you know, uniting the minorities, um, it also unites the oppressors, uh, which in a department with which is majority neoclassical can be a bad idea. More recently, I was offered a proposal to resolve the heterodox neoclassical conflict over hiring in our department, which again is a framing I do not accept from the outside, outset, but it proposed that we assign the various courses in our master's program to heterodox or neoclassical, thus institutionalizing the dualism and the idea that heterodox economists cannot do econometrics. Finally, I think it's just misleading the idea of the dualism between heterodox and orthodox economics. 
The philosophical foundations for institutionalism and Marxism, as well as institutionalists and Marxist feminists are anti-dualist. So a new dualism is an odd way to frame a collection of scholars made up largely from these traditions. I think that a better framework for understanding the diversity of thought in economics is a series of intersecting lines that may be subfields like labor and development and economic development economics. And here I want to do a call out to Suzanne because it's Suzanne's work against nations that really got me to start thinking about this stuff. Or they may be different schools of thought or subschools or thoughts like non-essentialist Marxism or radical institutionalism and so on, all of these different lines. Most heterodox scholars pull from several different bodies of literature from in and outside of economics and thus inhabit a space at the intersection of several of these lines, a space that may be unique to them. This framework requires scholars to define their location in this vast network of diverse thought because the possibilities are infinite, not dual. However, it also leaves intact the sort of coherence of individual schools of thought. One of the things that Bill Waller as an in radical institutionalist keeps saying is like institutionalist thought actually has a coherence. Many of these pieces that work together idea that if you do this too much pick and choosing without explaining what you're doing, um, that those things get lost and that coherence gets lost. So it's worth maintaining that. So the rejection of monism and monism masquerading as dualism requires the recognition that all knowledge is par partial. And this knowledge creation requires dialogue with scholars at different locations in the vast network of knowledge in order to create knowledge that looks more like a mosaic or a quilt than a painting or a sculpture. And Charu and I are part of a collective that has been trying to move in that direction. And so I'll pass it back to her to talk about that. Thanks, Barb. As you all might have realized, uh, beyond dualisms for us is not about giving you uh, a checklist of the three things you do. Well, we are going to give you a checklist. I promise you that. But, uh, uh, but uh, that if you do A, B, and C, you are no longer dualist. Uh, uh, and part of this is actually informed by our practice. I'm going to come to our collective at the end, but I'd like to start with four points that I would like to highlight that are central as takeaways from this talk. And to get me there, I'm going to start with some anecdotes because uh, uh, I actually now live my life in a non-divisionized interdisciplinary unit where I have to work with poets and biologists. Uh, and that has made me really understand uh, how limited our understanding of dissidents are. Uh, so here is the first point I want to start with. I was one of the people who were interviewed in the Mirman, uh, uh, Bajan uh, Yuzo book, you know, conversations with top heterodox people. And I gotta say, I liked it. I became full prof. I got like cited as a top, whatever. But I want to go back to the problem they faced. They interviewed a lot of us. And their final conclusion was that they didn't actually figure out what made us heterodox. The only thing that made us heterodox we weren't orthodox. And to me, that can either be viewed as a problem or as an opening. Uh, if your aim, and this I believe is the underlying problem, if your aim is to become the new orthodoxy, if your aim is that I want to do the right economics because those guys got it wrong, but I got it right. And if we just follow my project, my process, my heterodoxy, we will get it right. What you end up with is what I think of as conversations which are not actually among heterodox economists. Most heterodox economists speak to the orthodoxy. 
That's what they do. Very few of us have proactive, progressive, deep invested projects of speaking to each other and working out our differences. One of the very few places I've encountered it is first inside feminism, IAFI, because we were forced to. Everybody taught us as marginal to their projects. I don't know if anybody remembers the time when IAFI was forming and we were trying to figure out what is feminist economics. And we had six men, a post-Keynesian, a philosopher, a historian, an institutionalist come to lecture us feminist economists on how, as long as we became a post-Keynesian, a structuralist, a neo an institutionalist, we would include gender. That was pretty much what the early years of IAFI were. Bunches of heterodox men telling us the right way to be feminists. Uh, it was that, in some sense, the fact that we were in the margins of the margin that forced us to converse with each other. Uh, so I want to start there. Uh, that part of what I noticed and what Barb is pointing to is the heterodox project to the extent that institutionally it has been led as a particular kind of knowledge project has been led by a competitive effort by different groups of heterodox economists to take on the mantle of being the next neoclassicals. They got it wrong. We, the post Keynesians, got it right. They got it wrong. We, the neo structuralists, got it right. They got it wrong. We, the institutionalists, got it right. Uh, there is nothing more frustrating than finding that your allies are actually just as bad as your enemies. And I think that that's part of the experience that has shaped uh, our, uh, I, I'm going to be honest here, uh, sitting in panels where John Davis told me the right way to do identity was kind of frustrating. Sitting in panels where Bill Waller told me that I didn't get culture was irritating sitting in panels where I was told by post Keynesian and neo-structuralists that I need to have the correct Bill Gibson telling me that I did not understand the marginal, the marginal propensity to consume. He's like, at the end of my discussion about gender and consumption, his question was, are you saying men and women have different MPCs? And I said, seriously, that's your takeaway? Men and women have different MPCs. That's the dualism you got. And by the way, we published those papers because IAFI has been much more open than other fields to this because we've had to. So I wanna stop there because I want to say that one of the things we realized that dualism, and this is irritation, but it's also a realization. As long as your audience is the mainstream, and not each other, do not believe that you can build a social economics or institutional economics or radical economics project that's conversational among each other. Heterodoxy don't actually talk to each other. They utilize each other for their own projects. This is very similar to how economics treats interdisciplinarity. There is something that I have come to call disciplined interdisciplinarity, which is you've got a discipline, you look at the discipline and you decide, oh, in my discipline, we've got a gap. That gap is utility. Or in my discipline, we've got a gap. That gap is household. So what you do is you vulturishly go and look for the three ideas from another discipline that can fill your gap. You don't actually ask whether the building makes any sense. This has been interdisciplinarity in economics for a long time. This has been heterodoxy in economics for a long time. And so I feel that it had to be a long lesson for me as well. Uh, I was in this project. I was editing Rethinking Marxism. Rethinking Marxism didn't just emerge like Athena from Zeus's head because it had to make its name in an interdisciplinary field. We were forced materially we were forced 
to pay attention to people who didn't give a crap about neoclassical economics because they weren't economists. We were publishing and we had editors who were artists and you would ask them about, and they would be like, who cares? Or you would have like people who were uh, cultural theorists, uh, literary professors, they did not give a damn about neoclassicism. It completely transformed the terrain. So that is one thing I want to ask us, who is your audience? This really matters. Economics imagines it has two audiences. Strangely enough, for all that we wish to redo our core, we teach our core as still training people up to be part of one of our two audiences. One audience is that they will be in the profession. The other audience is that they will be in the state. So economics still in how it teaches, how it organizes itself and how it responds to the world actually has very little for even, for example, in intro micro in anything else that exceeds the state market dualism. We might talk about feminism. I have yet to see intro courses in either micro or macro in development or anything else that do, do not treat households as anything outside as instrumental to those two projects. Community exists either to show community can help markets and we don't need the state or community exists so that we can show that the state can help community. In itself, something like a community or radical project or sociology of community is not a robust element where households exist for projects beyond that dualism. This is terrible. This is not a good way to teach. This is not a good way to theorize. This is not a good way to treat feminists. Second, one way to break a dualism is to introduce a third term. intersectionality. To the extent that intersectionality has been treated as if you can disaggregate or treat as additive plus 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 both visually, metaphorically, and because we think that way technically, intersectionality has not been able to get the full-fledged expression that so many feminists inside IAFI and beyond uh, among black feminists and others have really been taking it. So for example, intersectionality in some of the more recent work has been about race plus gender or econometric tests to figure out how much is race and how much is gender. This is what could allow a Bill Gibson to ask me, do men and women have different MPCs? After I gave a whole discussion about the ways in which the social construction of gender was creating a historic concept of middle-class consumption to anchor the institution of the MPC through the actual institutions of USDA, 4-H clubs, and other ways to train rural women to actually consume. A lot of that was racial. Part of the consumption was showing that you were, you might be working class, but you weren't like those working class. Nayan Shah's work on the tile toilet is crucial. The extent to which minority communities had to adopt a tile toilet so that when the welfare officer came, they could believe that you should not have your children taken away from you it was crucial to the spread of the, 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 the racial spread of hygiene as a modern feminist project by feminist pioneers like Eleanor Roosevelt, Hill House and the others. That is a lot of what is built into capabilities approach, what is built into feminist ideas of 
how you empower your girls, how you take care of your children, how do you make sure that little girls go to college, go to school, have hygiene, right? Is built around racial dynamics of Asian exclusion. This is huge because this is the source of the model minority myth. It's because Asians were pitted against Blacks. When feminism works with in intersectionality, it has to work with intersectionality as a constitutive historical process of race formation, which is built on gender formation and vice versa. Women's studies does this. By the way, I know this not because Econ taught me this, but because I had to earn my tenure in women's studies. And I would have lost my tenure because my women's studies props would have laughed me out of school if I didn't know what I was doing. I was forced to learn this. I didn't learn this in economics. What we have done is we have developed ever better econometric techniques for disaggregation. Techniques that say, I have a better technique to figure out how much of this wage gap is race, how much of this wage gap is gender, how much of this wage gap is not explained by race and gender and is therefore intersectional. That is to the extent that we appropriate genres and techniques of statistics, we have not bothered to think through what the pre-assumption of disaggregation means for intersectionality. And for institutionalists, to do that, that's a terrible thing. The fact that lots of people in heterodox econ economics do this unthinkingly means that they are talking to mainstream economists. They haven't bothered to talk to institutionalists. So we are not talking with each other. Heterodoxy has made mainstream its audience. It has not made other schools of heterodoxy its audiences, its conversational communities, the people it cares about. If we think that our material theories about how institutions work are true, then we have to think about this institutional fact as shaping the knowledge we produce. Uh, the third thing then is that, uh, so I talked about the replacement model of heterodoxy that we will be the new orthodoxy uh, yeah, uh, the, and, and related to that, the kind of what I think of as the instrumental use of intersectionality to fill in our little gaps, uh, as opposed to really having a robust and, and engaged discussion where we are willing to let go our own analyses enough to integrate, as opposed to simply patching gaps in our analysis uh, uh, for our things having to do with history, with discourse, with gender and so on. Uh, I talked about intersectionality as not just being about aggregation, but as about a project of proactively breaking dualism. So here's another dualism. Development for me is a really interesting one. Why is development outside history? Why do we have economic history and development? It doesn't make sense to me, theoretically, unless you accept Hegel, as your base, that you would have two different fields like this. Why is development transition debates, the transition from feudalism to capitalism, which I've worked on, different than comparative economic systems debates about the transition from capitalism to socialism? And finally, why do I have to go through capitalism to get to communism or socialism? What is this teleology? Can there be no transition from feudalism, to, right? Like what is the historical imagination that is actually the architecture of how I teach comparative economic systems, economic history, uh, development, all three of which are often treated as marginal. And that architecture is that we're all oriented to neoclassicism, not to each other. Um, intersectionality, audience, like who are we teaching? Who are we writing for? I think that we are writing for the mainstream. I think we believe we're writing for each other, but a lot of our writing is us and the mainstream. Uh, I can't think of any really strong heterodox journals, which are purely about heterodox conversations across heterodoxy. Uh, we have a ton of them. We find our little niche, we go to our journal, and our journal very often is, this is 
our institutionalist journal plus how we critique heterodoxy. Uh, this is our feminist journal and how we critique neoclassicals. This is our Marxist journal and how we critique that. This is RRP, right? Cross heterodox journals of robust cross heterodox debate, discussion, conversation. I'm trying to think of them and I'm not, I'm coming up a little empty, I gotta say. Uh, I'm feeling a bit like Mirman at all, having interviewed all of us, deciding, I know you're not orthodox. What else, right? Uh, so that's an issue. And then finally, I want to therefore say that if we want to go beyond dualisms, in addition to breaking the idea of the dualism where our em the enemy of our enemy is our friend, you're not neoclassical, I'm not neoclassical, therefore we're all together. In this era of the Taliban, I, I don't think this should be a great model for us to actually put either our ethics or our analysis on. Uh, we haven't actually cultivated the practices we need for cross-institutional collaboration. And I finally think that we can't break dualisms until we stop imagining our role is to become the next neoclassical, the next top dog, the next person whom the government loves, the next person who will become the new Nobel Prize laureate. Uh, those are the institutions we despise, right? So why are we trying to enter them? We know that they're corrupted by power. So why is that our aim? Right? We think students matter. So why are we not thinking through all the things our students can do and be way beyond being either policymakers in the state or professional economists in the profession? 80% of the students who take undergrad classes will not do econ anyway in grad school. What do we think about them? Do they even matter to us? How do we teach them? What do we do with them? The current generation is worried about all kinds of things from intersectionality to climate crisis, to social justice, to community economies, to the failure of NGOs. And all of those are kind of elite boutique courses at the upper level that maybe five people teach, as opposed to being central to how we organize our teaching. And so I'm gonna end with a note of debt. Barb and I are part O to IAFI, but also owe to the fact that IAFI ended up feeling for us not maybe as hospitable uh, an environment as we had hoped. We came there with the thought that we wouldn't just be uh, outside neoclassicism, but we would actually find a diverse group. But as feminism basically became a combination of bargaining models and econometrics, uh, many of the deep questions that brought us to that field seemed to fall by the way. And while people weren't averse to this, they were no longer the center of how we organized either our conferences or our journals or anything else. And so what happened is a group of us uh, formed Feminist Radical Political Economy. Uh, it's a very diverse group, institutionalists, Marxists, development economists, post-Keynesians, uh, peace studies people, uh, and uh, empirical ethnographers, health theorists. But what keeps us together is that we're actually less interested in what our male colleagues or the neoclassical profession or the heterodoxy or even IAFI thinks of us. We are brought together by the idea that we'd like to figure out what we think of each other and what we want to say to each other. And the idea that our audiences include IAFI and Econ, yes, but we go to cultural studies. We go to the International Studies Association. We go to the Women's Studies Association. And the fact that we go there, not just we think we're writing about them, which is the economics understanding of how to do things. You write about women or about race, or for that matter, for example, about development, but the number of development economists who actually show up to area studies, I can count in a handful, you know, a uh, number of us in the US who actually show up for the South Asian studies meetings is, is teensy. Uh, you know, uh, we talk about South Asia, uh, we don't actually hang out 
with other people working on it. The number of people writing on Africa who show up for African studies meetings, very small. Uh, the number of people writing on black economies who show up for ethnic studies meetings, very small. Uh, if you believe your own theories about institutions, materiality and economics, why do you believe that you can do all this without showing up, talking to them, being among them? So for me, FRPE is a model of what collaboration looks like. Collaboration is very different than finding the two guys who can fill in the patch in your own theory because you had a gap you needed to patch it up. Collaboration looks like showing up, hearing what they say, learning their literatures, sharing your literatures with them, talking to them and changing your ideas as a result. And that I hope is what we share with ASE. ASE and institutions have taught us that institutions matter. Let us take the institutions of our knowledge creation seriously. Thanks. Well, thank you so very much to both of our panelists. I, I'm just fascinated by this talk. I think we all learned so much. Um, we have a lot of comments in the chat, um, especially talking about how powerful you both were in your presentation. So thank you again to both Charu and Barbara for your wonderful presentations. I really like how you summarize that we need to show up, right? We need to show up, support one another, and contribute to this discussion. Um, so with that in mind, uh, we do have a time now for a Q&A session. We have about 30 minutes allotted. If we need um, longer, shorter, whatever we need, we can be flexible with that. Um, so please, if you have any questions, either utilize the chat and I will ask, um, ask that, those questions and direct them to our panelists. Or if you have a question, please speak up now. Yeah, Iris, I have a question. Perfect. Um, and this is just a general question, so anyone can answer. And um, does anybody want to go before me? I don't want to be that person who says, well, you know, when, I'll ask it. Um, uh, and this is not, not, nothing against postmodernism. I think there's a lot of fantastic contributions from postmodern school of thought. But there's also this tendency that, you know, anything can go, right? If we do all these, um, What's the best way to describe it? How do we how do we prevent ourselves from falling in the trap where anything goes? And well, um, is the heterodox orthodox dualism necessary to ensure that we're in some sort of universal solidarity? Like what they're saying is is untrue, and therefore we can maintain our existence, our organizational capacity to fight that. But then the real effort is let's make sure that all the unnecessary distinctions within our own group are fixed so therefore we can combat this perceived universalism that the mainstream puts on which further alienates us and we're dealing with our own infighting etc cetera, etc cetera. so my main question is how do we prevent ourselves from falling in the trap that well among us anything goes and mainstream uh maintains its um uh oppressive hegemony for lack of a better phrase I I want to start with, you know, part of where I'm at at this particular moment in time is the, is, uh, you know, that idea, that criticism that the mainstream has made of us is really grounded in their inability to figure out how to evaluate ideas unless they're econometrics, right? I know how to, you know, if you're in the mainstream, it's like, Think of the number of ways in which they've evaluated heterodox work that is just stupid. Um, the examples that I've included here, um, but but you know, part of where I'm at with this is that I I have a colleague who had decided to offer a course called Marxism Theory and Reality in which he explains that um, Marx has this theory of primitive accumulation and then Stalin killed people. And so Marxism in a heterodox economics is evil. And I was trying to explain to my colleagues that this is problematic that in a variety of ways, that it's not an accurate description of Marxist theory. 
Um, it's really simplistic realize, re reasoning. And my neoclassical economy, my neoclassical colleagues have largely taken the position that I'm I'm sort of adding some, they, they take the position of sort of like, they take the position that anything goes and they expect us to agree that anything goes because they're, I, I'm sort of reading a lot into this, but the way I read it is, well, we tolerate you all and therefore you should tolerate this crap, right? Is, is that that's sort of the, so, you know, I would say that that whole accusation of us as relativists, um, I mean, I mean, we have a bunch of arguments for why that's wrong. Yeah. I think that we can come up with a bunch of criteria for evaluating good research that, that, you know, part of that is, is based on the um, intellectual community that you are coming from, is this consistent with that? Um, I mean, are your, there's a bunch of ways in which we can do criteria, but I think that that whole idea that what we do is relativist and what they do isn't, is just wrong from the get-go. Can yeah. I, can I, can I just stop? Uh, can I just intervene here? Uh, I'm unashamedly post-colonial theorist. I wrote I was the co-editor of Postcolonialism Meets Economics. Everything Biba asked from the beginning is, aren't you relativist? Aren't you saying anything goes? One of the first times we were asked this was when we said going to war in Afghanistan on the grounds of the veil is a disaster. Okay, I just want to let you know that it is bullshit to claim that we are relativist. When you say we are relativist, you don't mean we are relativist because when I do post-colonial theory, I got no difficulty judging you, not you personally, but you. My entire post-colonial theory is how you are racist and wrong. For you to read me telling you, you are racist, you are wrong, and come back to me and say, but aren't you being relativist? Anything goes, how are we to judge? I had no difficulty judging, I judged you. I judged you, I found you, Patriarchal, racist, white, dominant, colonial. What do you mean I can't judge? You can't judge. That's not my problem. I can judge. I judged you. I found you wanting. It is not my job to then tell you how you fix your problem. So this is the first thing I want to say. The repeated accusations of relativism are basically based on when I say, what you did was racist, you come back and say, well, but if I can't do this racist thing where I'm not allowed to bomb Afghanistan because they veil, what judgments are left? Or if I ask questions like, what do you mean you get to take the land away? And you say, well, are you saying that people killing their women are okay? I'm like, who told you that the way you solve people killing their women is to take away the land? I didn't. Are you really telling me? And this is what I'm asking direct straight up. The accusation of relativism is a deliberate obfuscation of the ethical failure of people who do not know how to judge if they cannot view themselves as the best and most superior people in the world. Full stop. I will not accept it and I will not answer it or dignify it with anything less than calling it racist, which is exactly what it is, right? So that's the first thing. Second, a lot of the obfuscation, and this is an argument I've had with Tony Lawson, is the confusion that empirical truth is the same thing as ethical truth. When you ask me about relativism, you are making a slippage a deliberate and quiet slippage between assuming that numbers is the same thing as ethics. I don't need numbers to have my ethical truths. My ethical truths come from somewhere else. They do not come, and, and they come from somewhere. They are worth debating. They're worth having arguments. They're worth having fights about, and I am more than willing to have those fights. Um, what did, uh... they are not, no, 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 but they are not 
They are not to be confused. This is the Tony Lawson realist move. They are not to be confused with scientific truths. The assumption that empirical scientific truth is the pathway to ethical positions is a bullshit philosophical argument that is just put forward as if it's true and that's not the case, all right? The, so I will give you an example. I was in Hawaii. Scientists over and over and over said they deserved that observatory because they provided the universal truth of science from that observatory that would quote unquote benefit all humankind. Whereas the Hawaiians were like, we worship our ancestors here. And there are spirits here and gods here. And my question was, I will actually accept I don't believe in spirits and gods and ancestors and whatnot. I'm atheist, okay? I do actually think the astronomers were right. At the end of the day, what gave the astronomers the right to therefore decide that this means they got the land? If you really believe that scientific truth authorizes anything else, I would like you to first go and put an observatory on Notre Dame displace all go go to go to go to the sort of place of where people who went through wars died and you put your observatory there then you come back the assumption that scientific truth authorizes property is the one that is unstated which is what economists contribute to i do not care if it is a scientific it's truth it's parsonian yeah it's it's got nothing to do with with ethics and so this is the first problem I will not accept that relativist claim. You are confusing scientific and ethical relativism. They're completely different things. Secondly, on scientific relativism, there's a bizarre confusion in economics between the quantifiable and the empirical. Yeah. It's as if nobody read Wittgenstein. Nobody understands what modern mathematics says about actual numbers. Okay, I, I, I agree that there is something called scientific and empirical truth, but there is a whole philosophy of science and economics confuses the quantifiable or the enumerative with the empirical, the enumerative and the empirical, they're not the same. So there are two slippages here. You go from the enumerative to the empirical, you go from the empirical to the scientific, and then you go from the scientific to the ethical. I do not accept that entire chain. I will not engage in this debate. It is a deliberate debate to undermine those of us who ask about colonial racial legacies as part of what we do. I don't play that game. I'm just really angry about it. <laughs> I'm sorry. My, 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 I, I hope my question wasn't offensive. I was just inquiring. So I don't want no, you to- No, no, I was... <laughs> I'm glad you asked it because it okay. had to be said. Okay, no. <laughs> well, thank, thank you for you. the question um, yeah. and answer session. We have another question from, we have two raised hands right now. So Dr. Razel Madaha, um, I hope I'm saying your name right. Could you please ask your question? Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, you pronounced the, uh, the name correctly, uh, it's Russell. Um, I, I was like following Charles Jackman on, uh, uh, you know, discussing uh, issues about other people, you know, the other, uh, without them being there, uh, talking about black people, talking about African people without them being there. Um, the thing is uh, now, um, when you come to the economics, uh, talking about dualism, uh, well, that sounds like it's a very hot topic, but you know, in the African context, uh, the situation is, uh, is a little bit different. Now here, uh, all scientists or social scientists uh, kind of uh, you know try to uh, engage with the government so there's some kind of a dualism between the scholars and the decision makers uh, the kind of uh, fighting uh, between the uh, uh, the scholars themselves uh, is, is not an issue so most of the time we kind of like uh, you know, do some research and find ways to influence the policymakers so that we can have some kind of a direct uh, influence on the thing that they do. So maybe that because of, uh, you know, the government being some kind of a welfare, doing a lot of stuff for uh, the country uh, as opposed to the, maybe, maybe the private sector. So maybe that might be the problem with uh, some kind of a whatever 
powerful government in, in that aspect. So uh, really, uh, I mean, that bit is like uh, almost not there. So uh, it's just my contribution. Thank you. Uh, maybe we can take two more questions. Amitabha's hand is up, Caroline's, Carol's hand is up. And if we take all three of them, then Barb and I can respond. That way we have more audience discussion. So who, who's next? Is it me? Yes, it is you, Amitabha. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, that was a very stimulating discussion. Um, but uh, I, I agree with many things, but I also disagree with many things, which is to be expected. Uh, the way I view uh, thinking and writing and studying, which is what we're supposed to be doing, is concepts um, and ideas like unified, dualistic, pluralistic, multiples, these are all ways of thinking and of conversing with each other. Incidentally, when I think, I converse with different parts of my, myself. So it's not like I privilege myself either, okay? Now, I think this idea of, of criticizing dualism or whatever you, you're calling this talk, I think is useful not to take any kind of tool too seriously, okay? And to that extent, I agree with you. On the other hand, dualism in many ways is far better than thinking of one thing, okay? For example, dualism can lead to problems about we versus they, okay? But on the other hand, ignoring differences is also like thinking of all people as men or all people as white, okay? Uh, in India as uh, Charu, right? Yeah, Charu, that's right. You're from India, I think, right? I am, I am from India, yes, I am. Yes, so in in university, you know, the Vedanta philosophy has two schools, the Daita, and the Advaita, right? Mm -hmm. Which is dualism and non-dualism. And they have argued about who's right and who's wrong. And the only conclusion I can come to is that they are both right and both wrong, okay? So first of all, let, let me just say that I, I don't know what is the dualism you're talking about. Are you talking about categories of people? Are you talking of categories of schools of thought? Are you talking of categories of ideas? For many of these things, you know, dualism may help and may create more problems. Compared to what? Compared to, uh, you know, unified approach or continuous approach or pluralistic approach where everything is fuzzy and nothing makes, you know, nothing can be clearly defined. Then we can't even talk to each other. Okay, so I think that you should, you should also stress the improvements that dualism does. I mean, without dualism, you cannot have dialectical thinking, okay? That is a great plus. Without dualism, you cannot even start talking about inequality. You can't start, start talking about, about uh, any debates that can lead to anything, okay? So, so I would suggest that if you think of dualism as a concrete thing to be criticized, I disagree with what you're doing, okay? But if, you, if you're saying that, I think many of what you're saying is about categorization and its problems, okay? Now, am I a heterodox economist? You're asking that question, what are we? I, I feel very uncomfortable calling myself not only a heterodox, but also an economist, okay? I'm just a, a, a lazy thinker. Lazy might mean because I'm not an activist, but I wish I could be. Anyway, that's my comment. Thanks. Caro? Yeah, hi. I want to thank Barbara and Sharu um, for this um, lecture. I thought it was very interesting. I learned a lot, um, and Iris for organizing it. 
Um, so um, something that stood out for me was this idea of who we speak to and who the audience is. And I think I'm just, I'm, I'm starting to get there because I think for so much of our career, academic career, particularly as women and as women of color, we're conditioned um, to speak to certain audiences, because, it's particularly in the Western world, right? Um, but I'm learning from my colleague, an economist actually, Christabel PJ at the University of Kerala, who tells me all the time, stop engaging in those conversations that only set up those binaries because there are other futures and the ones we're talking about are those that include commoning and cooperativism and for those of you that want to write in those kinds of journals check out kerala university's the journal of um, i think it's called polity and society because they're having these conversations to each other we just have to in our no in our very spoiled western institutions have to find our way into those kinds of institutions that are actually having the conversation that you and Barb, um, I think, did so well in terms of speaking of the varieties of dualism that exists. Um, but I wanted to just put a point here, and I would like your feedback on it, is this idea, of, I think it was in ten, about 10 years ago, a political scientist won the prize for economics, I know from the Nobel Prize, what have you, but she was actually speaking, she was actually troubling economists and stupid political scientists who were stuck in all these sort of binaries and dualisms that negate other kinds of voices. And that's Eleanor Ostrom. So I'm curious to hear um, in that search for trying to undo dualism, have we kind of gone beyond that now? Because there seems to be a, a really active movement of people who are talking about community economies, co-ops, uh, the future of the commons. And I'm wondering, is that a space that more radical feminists and particularly feminists of color can move? And I'd be curious to hear both of you speak on that. Sure. Barb, do you want to go first and then I go? I was quite kind of furious earlier and very vehement, so I think it's your turn. You're still muted. Okay. One of the things uh, about, you know, sort of this idea of you don't want to slip into a dualism, not dualism, dualism. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that I I had in the in a draft of this is the dualism. Of, my dad used to say there are two kinds of people in the world: the people that divide the world into two kinds of people, and those who don't. And um, so, so you know, by doing this, I, I you I don't want to I I don't want to take this sort of dualism too seriously, but I disagree with you that pluralism implies that nothing is defined. Um, now, part of this is comparative economic systems has always had an issue and, and institutionalism. So a bunch of the strains of thought from which I pull have always had to spend the first 10 pages of any article defining what your terms are, because we don't necessarily agree on what those terms, institutions do not agree on what an institution is. So um, you have, you know, it, in order to talk to each other, yeah, we have to define our terms. I think that's one of the things that we have to do in order to talk to each other. But I think of pluralism, encourages us to define everything and 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 do that so so i think i, I think pluralism is is a strength there um part of uh, on a very very simple level criticizing dualism is asking people to think outside the box to use an overused metaphor um but you know but but part of that Part of this sort of frustration is of dualism is people putting us into boxes and we're trying to break out of it. And you, the only way to do that is to try and get people to sort of redefine terms. Um, okay, in the sense of directions of where 
where do we go from here? As I said, comparative economic system stuff, those textbooks have all started to add community systems, systems based on community. And those are exactly the kind of things that Carol is talking about here. Um, and the, you know, one of the, one of the pieces I did in the, this sort of varieties of alternatives to capitalism is I was saying, okay, let's rethink the family. Let's talk about post families. Let's think about families in different ways and as things that we choose to sort of solve the care crisis problem. How do we, and one of the things in terms of sort of these projects of how do we address this is that I think, and, and FERPI has been doing a lot with this, of thinking about this issue of the problem of the state. We, you know, we're, we're at this point where on the one hand, you sort of need the state. On the other hand, the state is not very reliable on, you know, how do you, how do you think through projects that we can do without reliance on the state? And so I do think that, that again, forces you, you know, from a comparative systems, if this is about plan versus market, how do we create structures outside of that dualism that solve the pro crisis in social reproduction, right? That's one of the, you know, and that's sort of part of that, you know, that has to be where the questions are. And the only other thing that I wanna sort of throw in there in terms of that idea of what people are thinking now is, and it related to this dualism is this idea that people find it easier to imagine the end of the world than an end to capitalism. And, um, and that goes back to the stories that Chara was telling about students who are very concerned about the future. You know, um, it's, it's actually pretty easy to imagine the end of the world. And how do we start imagining not the end of the world? And that's what we have to be doing. And I think we have to get past dualisms to do it. Thanks, Barb. Uh, so let me go ahead and do my little response. Uh, so I'd like to start by responding to Russell's comment about how, uh, for better or for worse, uh, where he is and I, uh, or she is, uh, and uh, it's true in, it used to be true in India, then we had a different state, let me put it that way. Uh, and it's been true in other parts of the world where there has been a very interesting relationship between uh, economics uh, or economists and the state. Uh, uh, and state policy in very different ways. Uh, this equations, of course, changed at various ways as business schools have taken over that relationship uh, compared to economics or policymakers have. Uh, and what we used to do in econ with development and so on got disaggregated as, for example, political scientists or area studies and other people also started making it their business through peace studies through uh, foreign service exams, through international studies associations and so on of supply, as you will supplying the state. Because what we do is we supply the state with people and we supply the state with ideas, policies, articles, ammunition, right? And so I think of part of uh, thinking this through is that for me, it's very much, uh, contingent. This is why, to, to respond to one of the questions which I will more, more deeply uh, Amitava raised about dualism, I think that the title of this talk was not against dualism. The title of this talk was Beyond Dualism, which is that we acknowledged our debt to dualisms as some of our origin points and continuing to be real serious debts, uh, uh, you know, th this is, these are not like people, these are people I, I, I value, I take seriously, who have mentored me and whose work I really think 
very deeply about and very strongly about. Uh, and in fact, I think that many of them have done a lot about dualism. And so the Beyond Dualism was about where did these projects hit roadblocks? And the roadblocks we identified had to do with what we thought the project was about. And we did not think the project was about feminists turning into the next neoclassicals or the new uh, Nobel laureates. Uh, and much though I am delighted with Janet Yellen, I do not really think this was the center of why IAFI did IAFI, which is that we would be the next Harvard, the next Yale, the next MIT, the, the sort of women in positions of power. Uh, it was a different project. It was a project that did not imagine that our role was simply to get more women in power and everything would be fixed. So the beyond dualism was really about that. So in answer to your question, I'm not against people working around with the state. My question really is given where we are right now, and it's going to vary in different countries, I do not claim to have a good institutional knowledge of uh, uh, sort of the, the broader African academic context. I know a little bit of South, about South Africa, and I know uh, a little bit uh, about some of the stuff that's happening in Nigeria and Ghana because of some people I know there, but that's about the extent of my uh, knowledge there. Uh, I used to know more about East Africa because of Iman, but you know, with uh, the sort of uh, difficulties there uh, and the role of academics shifting, it's it's working differently. It's different in Latin America, and I'll come to that in a minute, uh, especially around Caro's question uh, on community economies. And it's different in Middle East. I mean, and it's very different. I mean, not just in 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 South Asia, so in India, India has a very deep and different relation to the state. So for example, if you talk to my colleagues in South Asia, which would include Pakistan and Bangladesh, and not just India, the way in which my feminist colleagues talk about the relationship to the state is very different, right? So Bangladesh, not India, was the centerpiece of where the state was replaced by the NGO due to Grameen Bank. And so the relationship to the NGO has become much more central to what they're doing in Bangladesh uh, uh, as compared to India. Uh, in Pakistan, Pakistan was way ahead of us in India when it came to the question of what does it mean for the state to get, get captured by religious minority, by, by religious uh, majority, and what does that mean for feminism? I mean, what was happening among Pakistani feminists with Asma Jahangir and the other was much more advanced than what we really understood in relation to the question of secularism when it came to India. For example, Indian feminists were still thinking of secular law in a different way. So part of the beyond dualisms is to take the heterodox economics insights about institutions seriously. There is not a state. There is not the state. There are institutions of the state which means that you cannot think that the policy of, Gra of Grameen Bank, which was then sent off all across the world as some kind of universal solution, and Suzanne's work has taken this up, is a solution for everything, right? It is because it assumed a singular binary or dualism between state, market, economy, household, that you could then do a singular policy for all institutions in all countries. And then when the policy didn't work, it wasn't that the policy was wrong, it was that the country was wrong. They weren't developed enough, they lacked the culture, their attitudes were not good enough. If our policies failed, it wasn't because our policies failed. Our policies failed because they were failed somehow. The failed state, the failed this, the failed that. And so to me, that's what I would say. I, I don't think I can give a universal answer to you, Russell, about how we handle this issue between our profession and the state. I don't think we should have a universal answer because, for example, the relationship between the economics profession and the state in a country like the USA is so still kind of, I don't know, still sadly fighting Cold War ideologies and tied to ambivalences and so on. And that's just not the history elsewhere. There's no reason that that should be the universal model 
of how a profession handles its relation to the state. On the other hand, we don't want to naturalize the state as the reply to the market. And that's the danger we face, uh, that, we, we, that, that, that these dualisms become their own logic. So that replies to uh, Amitabha, who's not here, so I won't go into my debates about his actual understanding of Vedanta philosophy, which I don't agree with. But I would point out that the one group that's not here is Amitabha and me are both elite. Uh, we are both from Savarna classes. I, I think you would get a very different reply to what's going on if you asked a Dalit scholar about Vedanta philosophy and how to do it, which is a bit like asking a black scholar, who do you think was better on slavery? Jefferson or you know, so and so. And, and you might get a slightly different reading of that history than you would if you actually asked, uh, 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 say, W.E.B. Du Bois. So ask an Ambedkarite, you might get a very different reply on the question of Vedanta. That's what I'm going to say. He's not here, or I would say more. Uh, but yeah, the binarism and dualism of Hindu philosophy is not exactly unrelated to uh, caste hegemony, which is even deeper and as bad as, as white hegemony, uh, including slavery, including bonded labor, and so on. So that's what I'm going to say. Uh, which finally brings me to Carol's question about community. I think Carol. I do believe we should take community and solidarity economy seriously. I mean, I'm a Marxist. I wouldn't be a Marxist if I didn't think that the end goal, for me, the end goal is not the end of capitalism because feudalism, capitalism, slavery, I mean, right now, if you look at some of the anti-capitalist struggles, many of them are pro-feudalism struggles, right? Many of them are nationalist nativist struggles, keep the market out, keep our cultures, right? To me, this is why the transition debates are really bogus, because they stage a linearity, which is not how history looks and how ethics look. To me, the question of solidarity economies really is that we need to think through how different communities are doing this question. So for example, uh, how uh, co-ops in urban cities like Philadelphia are doing this very different. And in fact, we're finding my state of Seattle, we are finding my city of Seattle, uh, we have lots of co-ops, but it's not, uh, it's a very white movement. It's organic, it's white, it doesn't actually integrate questions of uh, racial justice uh, around say farmers movements. Uh, we had to have a completely different group that finally won the very first uh, you, uh, sort of uh, victory on uh, the H2A visa, which is nothing more than a slave visa as far as I can tell for farmers coming from Mexico. Everybody thinks that the question of Mexico is at that Southern border. They forget there is a Northern border. Uh, we also uh, uh, have a lot of uh, agriculture out here in Western Washington. So those kinds of questions kind of often get missed if you just do solidarity without realizing that this is one of the biggest questions of solidarity and community, which is communities often have in groups and out groups and hierarchies. So the question is who is the community, who is in the community, can't just be shunted aside as a question of, well, it's the community as opposed to the household or the market or the nation. All the questions that we ask about nation in relation to state are there for community. Uh, so for example, I do think that the decolonial move, this is now for those who follow this, is different from the post-colonial move for a very specific reason. It's not just that, oh, it's decolonial, it's post-colonial, it's indigenous, it's this, it's that. Indigenous people are closer to nature, which is what I think of the binarist uh, sort of view of culture as a disembedded thing. Indigenous people have some kind of, I don't know, relation to nature. And of course they have a relation to nature, they work with it. I have a relation to the bus system, okay? I know whether I'm going to miss my bus, how much time I have. Do I have to tell the student, sorry, I'm gonna miss my last bus, okay? It's not, it's, I, I use it, 
okay, I have a really keen sense of what the weather looks like and which days of the week that I can risk taking five minutes extra to catch the bus and which days I'm going to have a tight connection. Nobody thinks that this is because I have a brainless or top, I don't know, uterine connection to buses. They understand it's because I use buses, okay? Obviously, people who live off the land have a deep connection to the land. They know it. They know what it looks like. They know what grows in it. They have a sense of the weather. Every time I walk my dog, I'm looking out and I know I, without even looking at my phone, whether it's going to rain in Seattle or not. Nobody has ever accused me of having some kind of indigenous rain, whatever, all right? So this is what I mean. The decolonial thing is about asking us to recognize knowledge that comes from practice. This is a deep knowledge that comes from practice. It has to be recognized as such, but it's also about a very specific set of problems which have to do with settler colonialism. Okay, the post-colonial turn, which is what I was part of, what Iman was part of, was in context where we were trying to deal with what it meant after colonialism to have your own nation state. All right, India has its own nation state. But if you ask the people in Jharkhand, if you ask the tribals, if you ask the community, they might have a very different question about whether or not they have got the state they wanted after independence. It took a while for us to figure that out because we were so tied up with the nation state and anti-colonialism, we were not able to look at the internal fragmentation of the state. Ask a Kashmiri, their relation to the Indian state is gonna be very different, right? And so if you look at decolonial, part of the question they were asking post-colonial was whether or not you could think of solutions that anchored, and this goes back to the original question by Russell, that anchors the nation state. Because the nation is not a unified. It's not just in America that we have diversity or power or difference, it's across the world. And in Latin America, decolonial has come forward. And as you know, Caro, in parts of the world where you work, which are all about settler colonialism, this has come forward because there is deep questions about what do you do if you're a settler colony and you are not the majority? This is the first time I had to encounter this question was when I was in Hawaii and John Osorio told me, Charu, you can critique the nation state all you want. I will critique the nation state once I have my own country. Till then, <laughs> I'm not going to go there. So this is, a, this is a really, this is what I mean by positionality. I don't just mean anything goes. I mean locatedness, that, that there is a certain, uh, and I don't mean that you have to occupy the location personally, because I did not become Native Hawaiian to start understanding this, but that you have to have the capacity to grasp that the questions you're asking come from a particular set of issues that come forward to you. And I think the decolonial turn is about how do you address land rights? How do you address property rights? How do you address commons? when you are in a settler colony. And that's why I don't think the Elena Lindstrom solution is sufficient. Because I think that, not that it's wrong, but it's insufficient. It works for some parts of the world. I'm really hesitant, and this uh, is my reply to Antava about universalism. My objection to universalism is not the idea that we are all humans. My objection to universalism is that we are all humans who live under the same conditions. Uh, it's that second part of universalism that I am trying to really call on the question. Uh, let me end here. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, Iris had to leave as, as she mentioned, but this has been a just wonderful discussion. Um, I felt like I really had to be on like my game for catching like uh, everything in the chat and uh, everything that our discussants brought and those that brought uh, questions both in the chat and out. Um, can we just one more time say thank you to uh, Barbara and Charu and uh, also the questions as well were just wonderful. <laughs> um, with that, I, I think we are out of time for this uh, third webinar for uh, the ASC. Uh, again, thank you all so, so much. This was, this was great. <laughs> thank you. Thanks everyone.